downside of being the guy who uh, uh, does the intros is that I have to intro myself. So I'm, the, I'm the next uh, speaker. I'm going to talk a little bit about building a uh, malware analysis lab. Um, I've already told you a little bit about me. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, uh, I'm not going to go into, into too much extra detail uh, other than what I've already told you. But my, my background is generally uh, Department of Defense. I worked for the Army Research Lab for quite some time. I helped them build out some of their uh, security operations and capabilities. Uh, I took that to that's what took me to Charleston. Uh, where, I, where I worked with Spay War for a while, helping them build up uh, their initial implementation of their uh, computer network and disk service provider. Um, after doing that, I uh, moved out of DOD back to the private sector, worked for a company called the Guardians for some time, uh, and now I'm working with Mania, which is a fire on company at the truck over here. Uh, I used to put pictures of myself on this slide, but then I realized y'all could see me, so I just started to pictures of the bar. Um, if you like any of the stuff I'm going to talk about today, uh, I've written a couple of books on, on this and some similar topics. Uh, practical hacker analysis focused on uh, uh, kind of ground zero to um, from zero to 60 knowledge on using packets for uh, security purposes and just general troubleshooting purposes as well. Uh, and applied network security monitoring, which is all about monitoring network connections uh, intuitively and using tools uh, with that to uh, catch back in us. So uh, I'm going to talk about a couple things today. It's, it's a short talk. It's only 10 to 15 minutes. Um, but I'm basically going to talk about if you want to do malware analysis and you've never done it before, how you can kind of just get started with it really quickly. I'm not going to go really into technical, just kind of some, some general thoughts, some best practices, uh, some things that I like to do. Uh, again, everything in this presentation is kind of the way I prefer to do it, and, and you know, your mileage may vary. Um, I like to leave, you know, every time I give a presentation like this, I like to give a sentence or two that describes uh, what you can take away from it. And hopefully that day, you know, how can I build a malware analysis lab without spending much money and what are some best practices? Uh, so it's generally just what we're talking about. Anytime I talk about dissecting malware and actually executing malware on the system, uh, I have to give a little bit of a disclaimer because uh, if you're reckless at all and not paying attention, it's very easy to do some serious damage. Uh, we have real practical cases where malware can erase your hard drive. Um, if you follow the Aramco attacks or, or the North Korean attacks, uh, or alleged North Korean attacks, I guess, uh, you saw that there's malware that can uh, erase your hard drive through various mechanisms. Uh, there's, if you've heard of CryptoLocker, there's malware that can go out there, find all your files, and zip them up, encrypt them with a password that you have to pay uh, $1,200 to get. Uh, that's no fun. Uh, they can hijack your social networking identity, steal your password and things like that. And unfortunately, they can also hijack your real identity. So we're talking about RAM scraping and, and pulling social security numbers out of, uh, out, of RAM, out of memory. That's a, that's a very real thing. So if you're not careful and you have this isolated environment, it's not as isolated as you think it is, uh, bad things can happen. Uh, and this is, the, the, is, as bad as this is, this pales in comparison to if you're running malware and on the other end of it, you can expect to a command and control server, there's actually a human there who wants to do bad things. Uh, that's much worse than anything this. Uh, so be careful. Uh, so analyzing malware, why do you want to do it? Um, besides just having a sick aversion to, to dissecting other people's code, which is kind of fun, um, it's a pretty critical function of a lot of security-related things. Uh, I work in intelligence, uh, so mainly what we do a lot of the time is we send folks out to incident their response uh, at gigs. So uh, somebody gets hacked into, they call us, we go in, we figure out what happened, we contain it, and we eradicate it. Uh, through that process, there's generally some form of malware that's used, uh, even if it's just a civil backdoor or a dropper or or something tied to a phishing attempt. Uh, we go in and we uh, find that stuff, we pull that malware back, we dissect it, we pull out indicators out of it, and that's how we build detection to detect it if we ever see it again. Furthermore, we also use it for attribution. A little bit of a fuzzy science, but if you look at enough malware, uh, malware is ultimately written by people, they have habits and tendencies. Uh, you can pull those things out of malware, correlate those together, do some fun graph theory stuff, and out pops uh, you know, the name of the guy who made the malware, or at least an attribution to the group, uh, so to speak. So it's very useful. Uh, the biggest thing really here, um, even if you don't do this, do that for a living, it's very desirable skill in security. I really thought I understood systems very well until I started dissecting malware. The best way, I think, to learn how systems work at an OS level and at a low level is to dissect malware and see how people try to mess with it. Because you see how they try to take something that works normal, interject things into it, make processes talk to things that they shouldn't, uh, hide things, and that's a really good way to learn your system. Uh, it's really critical for building the 
filtration systems, doing network security monitoring, doing packet analysis, it really applies to all of these. So even if you don't do malware analysis for a living, or don't desire to, uh, if you work in security, it can and will help your ability to do that. Uh, malware analysis generally breaks down into two processes, behavioral and code analysis. Uh, behavioral analysis is essentially executing the malware on a contained system uh, and observing what it does. Right? So whether it's, it's, it's copying itself to another location, making a startup process, doing a keylogger, uh, observing that as behavioral analysis. Code analysis is uh, kind of the work of the trickier end. That's where you're actually taking the, the code that's compiled usually, pulling it apart, uh, running it through debuggers and things like that, and actually looking at uh, a lot of times uh, you know, the jump code of what makes that uh, assembly code, what makes that tick, that safe and bad, you know, functions and functions. Um, a lot of times to do thorough malware analysis, you're not going to do both of these things. You only get so far with one, and you have to jump to the other and go back and forth. Um, most folks who do this kind of casually stick with behavioral, because it's, it's certainly easier, uh, not that it's easy, but uh, it's kind of where you start. You know, when you're doing what we initially call binary triage, which is kind of the first part, where you want to determine, first of all, is something evil, then that's kind of where you're spending your time. When I talk about setting up a malware analysis network, um, you don't really need a lot of computers, you don't need a lot of network equipment, all you really need is one. Uh, I do a lot of my malware analysis right here uh, on my laptop. Uh, I have some other systems I do it on as well because I do a lot of it, but other than that, generally you only need one system that's virtualized, right? So in this case, you know, the internet's up here, you have a physical host, and you have all these virtual machines, and these are isolated virtual networks. So in this case, uh, this is Ubuntu Linux box, it's also this room Linux box, uh, this room hack is also this room Linux box, and so on. Everything in these little red circles can talk to each other, uh, but not outside of that. Certainly not to the physical host, and most definitely not to the internet. We don't want that. Uh, I see virtualization as a must because it's generally going to be free or cheap. Virtual box is free. Um, I use uh, uh, VMware Workstation over here, actually VMware Fusion for my Mac. Uh, it's not too expensive. I think it's two hundred dollars. Um, well worth it if you're using it extensively. Uh, VMware ESXi is a server technology, so if you just have an old system uh, or just another system, you can store all this in one place. It allows you to spin up virtual machines uh, exclusive to that in an operating system. Uh, so it's, it's free. Uh, the big thing is configurable networking, so I can set up all these virtual machines uh, and so I can tell them basically how they're allowed to talk to each other. Also, I can then isolate them from my, uh, from my host. I use the term host and guest. Uh, if I'm doing this on my laptop, the laptop itself, the Mac operating system is the host. Every virtual machine underneath that, whether it's Windows, Linux, whatever, that's a guest. Uh, so I'm isolating all the guests from the host. Uh, and again, certainly isolating that from the internet. So whatever's talking, uh, whatever this malware is talking about, you don't want to talk about it. Uh, and the big thing is snapshots. Uh, yeah, not visual. So uh, snapshots are useful. Uh, it's probably the, the number one feature. Malware, malware is generally unpredictable. You never know what it does until it does it. Uh, many times I've had an executable, I've double clicked it, and the system wipes itself, right? So that uh, makes it hard to analyze when it does that. Um, and that's, that's the easiest thing, right? Like it's, it's one thing it just wipes itself, it's another thing it like, tries to change your password. Or I've had malware once that took the screen and literally just turned it upside down, right? Like it's stupid, it's going to be uh, so snapshots, I had to snapshot a system at a point in time. So basically, I'm going to set up my system how I want it to set up, take a snapshot, then I'll run the malware. Right? So if the malware does anything I'm not cool with or that I need to maybe uh, put myself in the middle of somehow, uh, I can stop and I can revert back to that. So you see that's how you have You have the pristine state here, the snapshot here, maybe before you turn the malware on, uh, and then you have one here. So if I run the malware, it does something that I don't want to do. One click, I'm back to the previous state. Probably the feature I use most of anything I do with malware analysis is, is doing that and reverting. Um, and you can also do this laterally too. So I can run it and make a snapshot here and run it here, and I've got it running in two or three different states, being all the time. Two or three different tools. That's what it's uh, networking, I've already talked about this a little bit. Um, again, be careful not to connect to the devices to the internet. Uh, it's not so much for your own protection as it is for other people's. Uh, if you run malware, a lot of times it may be configured to denial of service, some other network. Uh, the last thing you want is uh, Microsoft calling you and saying why, well, or calling your ISP at least and saying why is this computer for a file service on the network. Um, and that's not even the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is the FBI shows up here at your door and why the file service and this is going to ask Something easy to laugh about, but it's, I've seen it happen to people I know. Something's been misconfigured, they've run some malware and they start doing bad stuff to the. 
Um, hardware, this one's pretty easy. You don't really need a lot of hardware to do this stuff. Uh, people like recommendations. This is generally my loose rule of thumb, and this is kind of overkill. Um, RAM, I say to run two infected machines at once, uh, Windows machines, because that's generally what this is going to be. Um, I want four gigs of RAM, I want about 50 gigs of storage, just because tools uh, take a little bit of room, the logs they generate take a lot of room. So this, my rule of thumb, you can go less on the storage, but I say scale for you. So yeah, this is for two, if you have four, double it, so it scales pretty much. Um, for software, uh, most of the malware you're typically going to analyze realistically is Windows malware. I used to, up until really a couple years ago, I, I did most all of this on Windows XP, is what I you know, executed and detonated my malware in. Uh, recently I switched to Windows 7, just as, as a nature of uh, what most of the malware will actually run on. Well, I usually try to keep it as simple as I can. Uh, sometimes that calls for other operating systems, but most of the time I'm working on Windows 7, but in that case, uh, it's actually detonated the malware. Uh, Windows isn't free, unfortunately, so if you're going to do this, that complicates things a little bit. Uh, that's 30 day trials, it's a little tedious, but you can Spin up an instance of Windows for 30 days, install all your tools on it, then it's malware, uh, and you can do that repeatedly. Um, also, you can obviously just buy a license if you can do this in a lot of people, you probably want to go. Um, and if you're doing this for work purposes, um, the MSDN account is a, is a good uh, corporate uh, avenue for purchasing uh, licenses for lots of Microsoft products. These products are relatively cheap. Uh, all that's our work provides, so um, they pay basically a certain amount, and then anybody in the company can download Windows at not an option for everybody, but super useful. Uh, something to mention briefly is Remnix. Uh, Remnix is a, a free malware analysis uh, Linux distribution um, made by Lenny Zeltzer, who uh, is a SANS faculty member and teaches our malware reverse in class, and it's very good. Uh, it's basically just a Linux distro with a bunch of pre built tools. If you're analyzing Linux malware, you can do it straight on the box. Um, the big thing it's used for when analyzing Windows malware is when you have a uh, Windows malware that's trying to communicate out, right? It's trying to communicate to something else. Uh, if it's trying to download a second file from the internet, for instance, you don't actually let it go out to the internet to do that. You basically manipulate that box uh, where its traffic is intercepted by another box. Remix is, is a good way to do that. You can intercept that and see what the system is trying to download. Uh, um, one of the, the last things, uh, there's just a few pro tips, um, things I've learned. Uh, the top one is probably my most, my most uh, practical tip color code your virtual machines. Anytime I have a virtual machine or a system that I'm going to infect with malware, it has a red background. Right? Especially, this is especially important. I, mean, I use a Mac, but if you use a Windows box for this, it is really easy to have a Windows 7 host and a Windows 7 guest with, with like a browser window or something maximized, switch between them, and accidentally copy the malware to the wrong place and click the wrong thing. It happens. I've done it. Uh, I do it a lot less now that I have Mac color code these things. Uh, so I, every malware system I have uh, is Big red background, so I know red background. Um, and more so, it also makes sense if you have that browser window open. The worst thing you can do is have a box that's infected with a key logger that's transmitting stuff somewhere, and then you log into your online bank account. Uh, another thing I try to do is leave a terminal window uh, with the IP address on it uh, always open, so I can reference it not only quickly, but also again distinguish between a host and a guest, and also what network something is on. If something's on my Production network, I want to know if something's in a guest network that's isolated, I want to know if make sure that separation is there. <laughs> snapshot, early snapshot often. I can think of a billion times where I wish I would have snapshot it. I can think of no times where I regret snapshotting. Right, uh, don't leave infected machines. I've watched uh, a lot of malware has sleep routines, so it may not do anything bad now, it may not do anything bad tomorrow, but if you leave it open all weekend, on Sunday it may decide again, it wants to not service something, it wants to host something else. It constantly, for that matter, it may just decide it wants to do something that makes your CPU spike to 100%, which costs you a little bit of a little extra of your uh, electric. Uh, and lastly, always encrypt and password protect malware and transmission. If you do this a lot, you're going to share malware samples with people, or you're going to submit them to, to websites, things like that. When you can, uh, always zip them up, encrypt them. Uh, that way, you know, scanning tools don't pick it up and strip them out. And generally, uh, the kind of unspoken thing with, with malware analysts is if you're going to encrypt a piece of malware, uh, password you're going to use is infected. So chances are if someone gives you a piece of malware that they want you to analyze or you found on the website and it's password protected, infected is kind of the de facto standard industry thing. Or infected with some characters. Uh, a couple of learning resources. Um, I think practical, practical malware analysis 
uh, is probably uh, it's possibly one of my favorite uh, IT security books I've ever read. Uh, it, take, it assumes really no basic knowledge other than some, some real limited systems knowledge. It takes you again from zero to 60. Uh, it has a lot of basic and advanced things, both behavior and code analysis. Uh, it also has a big like it has real malware with it, so it has a, a disk and a companion website. Uh, every chapter has real samples you can download and dissect yourself, and it has a little quiz. So, you know, it says, take sample one and tell me what X does, uh, and then you can go and find X and sometimes find Y and so forth. So, uh, that's really helpful. Uh, I think it's $35. Uh, it's one of the, the again, the best information for you website I can recommend. Uh, even if you're not interested in malware, it has a whole section on system behavior. So, it talks about nothing but uh, certain system behaviors that malware attempts to take advantage of. Uh, and that is incredibly useful for anybody in security. Last but not least, if you're real serious about it, saying it's a course about it, uh, Lenny Zeltzer, uh, again, he wrote Remnants. Uh, he's one of the best uh, at this period, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it was a six day course I took it uh, a few years ago, three or four years ago. Uh, goes pretty fast paced, uh, but if you're really into doing this seriously, it's a good route. Uh, kind of expensive, but it's Um, so that's pretty much it. The good thing about malware analysis, and I was just talking some about this earlier, is that it's very easy to get into. There's no shortage of malware samples. Uh, BXShare.com is a good website. They have something like uh, over a petabyte of malware samples you can download. Uh, you can also get some of the stuff on Firestore. Um, yeah, and malware analysis generally is one of those things, the more you do it, the better you get. So if you sit and do nothing to analyze malware all day, you're going to get really good at it. Um, I don't do much malware analysis with my current job, but every now and then I'll just find out how much to buy and sit down and play with it for a while to keep the skills fresh. And, and it's really one of those things, again, the more you do it, the better you are. Uh, I believe that's it. Any questions? The malware samples, do you get source code ever with those, or is it just binaries? Um, like in the book or just in general? In, in general. Um, I mean, if they're, if they're compiled, no. Generally not. You're not going to get source code. That's when you're, then you're looking at it like the the hex dumps and the jump code or the assembly code, and you have to have some knowledge of that and figure that out. Uh, if it's a non-compile, so if it's like web-based, like PHP or something like that, sometimes you can get the, the code there. So that infrastructure you mentioned, um, are you not worried about the malware, uh, any malware that's smart enough to break through the hypervisor? <laughs> I'm not practically. Um, there's not a lot of malware that's ever actually been proven to do that, which is something to talk about. Uh, I've only ever seen two cases of it in the, in the real world. One was in the wild, and one was when I was working in Guardians that we actually, some of the folks I worked with wrote. Um, so it's not practical enough that I, I've ever seen it that I would be worried about. Okay. Chris, do you uh, run across any type of the sample side of the DM? Yeah. So the question was, do you run across samples that are uh, aware that they're in a virtual machine? I actually do see this, not super often, but on occasion. Uh, lots of malware will have routines in it to try to check if it's being debugged or uh, intercepted or if it's in a VM, and then it won't run. Uh, there are ways to check for this. Uh, I mean, there's ways for malware to determine this. There's ways to go in and check to see if the, the malware is doing it. The general approach to this is, it's obviously sometimes you just have a virtual machine. That's what you have. You don't have a physical machine where you can analyze this and get past that check. What you can do uh, once you become skilled in, in, in active debugging, which is where you kind of run the application and see if you catch it before it runs certain functions, you can find the function where it checks for um, uh, the a virtual machine and then kind of reroute it past that, so to speak. And that, that's really what a lot of, uh, kind of dynamic plus combined code analysis is. is you, you let the malware run to a certain point, find certain functions, and then trick it into doing other things it's capable of, or trick it into not doing things. And I'll just observe that for software that's intended to run on a server, malware that's intended to run on a server, just about all software runs in VMs on servers. So they stop doing that. Yeah. Any other questions? What about uh, stuff that's waiting for command and control instructions from outside? I mean, it's kind of hard to you kind of have to be online to intercept some of that. I mean, if it's phoning home, you can obviously catch that and try to imitate some of that with the web server and stuff like that. But yeah. So what I would do in that case, especially was, you know, what about systems that are trying to talk to a command and control server do further commands? Generally, in order for that binary to be able to respond to those commands, they're going to be somewhere in the code, right? It's going to have to know what they are and interpret them and do something. 
uh, through that code analysis, breaking this down into functions and things in, a, in a assembly code, you can actually find these things, uh, find those functions. And that's what I talk about where you take, where you, you take the program, you're watching it running, and then you make it jump from place to place. So if you can artificially induce that jump somehow, right. then you can make it run those commands. Or you can feed them back to it artificially. Craft network data, craft packets, send those to it, and watch them. Uh, uh, it's kind of a cat and mouse game in that regard, especially because it's expecting something and you have to give it to it, and it's expecting something else and you have to do that again. Um, it's kind of exciting to enjoy doing that type of thing. But, yeah, but if you find out it, it's like asking to download like an A.exe, do you try to intentionally go out to where it's phoning home to see what that well, that's yeah. people is? Especially droppers, I mean, if it's just trying to download another malicious file that's really going to do their dirty work, then yeah, you're just going to go out and download it. You have okay. precautions. Uh, you don't want to run it, but uh, on your, your health system, but yeah, go ahead and download it, securely transfer it to your VM. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, thank you, folks.